Does your computer lag while running hot and sounding like a jet engine? Well, you can do something about it. What performance? Hello and welcome back. Today I'm looking at reducing power and heat while improving GPU and gaming performance. The first topic is how to reduce CPU power. CPUs today are incredibly powerful and they use every last drop of power to reach that last millisecond boost. We're going to be looking at alternatives, the easiest way of switching modes and the trade-offs in doing so. We're also going to take a look at the performance results afterwards and look at a preview of the GPU undervolting that I have done and which will be covered in detail in the upcoming video. I've also just surpassed 200 subscribers and I want to thank every one of you for your support. Doing all the testing, making these videos on my spare time takes a lot of time, so I really appreciate your likes, your feedback and for subscribing. My next goal is to reach 500 subs, so I will be thrilled if you would consider hitting that subscribe and bell button. To better understand the power distribution in a modern laptop, we are first going to take a look at Nvidia's Dynamic Boost 2.0, which is very similar to AMD's Smart Shift. Let's listen to NVIDIA's explanation before diving into it a bit further. The CPU and GPU. Yet games and creative apps are dynamic, and demands on the system change from frame to frame. Today we are introducing Dynamic Boost 2.0, which for the first time uses AI to shift power between the CPU, GPU, and now GPU memory, determining where it is needed most. The AI networks in Dynamic Boost 2.0 manage power on a per frame basis so your laptop is constantly optimizing for maximum performance <laughs> wow ai network and frame by frame adjustments that sounds fantastic but let's take a look at it a bit further using the example of the lenovo slim 7 pro x it has a 6800 hs cpu and a rtx 3050 graphics card now the total tdp for the cpu and gpu combined with extreme performance is 70 watts but the more grounded option is intelligent cooling with 60 watts the CPU has a maximum boost of 65 watts, while the GPU has a max boost of 55 watts. That amounts to 120 watts of power requests contained in a 70 watt total GPU and CPU budget. The CPU and GPU needs to share this power. If the CPU draws 60 watts, then the GPU is left with 10 watts of power. If the CPU draws 40 watts, then the GPU can draw 30 watts. And when the CPU is being used sparingly and only drawing 20 watts, well then the GPU can boost up to 50 watts. I think that a more apt comparison to the AI powered network is an animal fight about who gets first dibs at the food. And this is a fight that the CPU tends to win and something that we are going to look at changing. There are many ways to go about reducing CPU power and the three alternatives I've been testing are disabling CPU boost, altering the maximum CPU frequency and setting a custom TDP. Disabling boost prohibits the CPU from boosting higher than its base frequency, which is 3200 MHz in the case of the 6800 HS. It does enable all cores to boost to 3200 MHz, which still provides a good multi-core performance, but it does also prohibit single core tasks to utilize a higher frequency. Setting a maximum CPU frequency does the same as disabling boost, but here you are able to fine-tune the frequency to your liking. Using a custom TDP does not alter the boost frequencies, and single core tasks can therefore be tuned to perform optimally, but it does cap the CPU performance for multi-core tasks if you set the TDP too low. Do keep in mind that there are no silver bullets, and reducing the CPU boost or TDP will lead to decreased performance in some workloads. So the goal is to find in which areas you can opt for reducing power, and where you want the CPU to boost fully. When testing on the Lenovo Pro X, I have found that custom frequencies does not work as the laptop is agile in changing the power settings. Custom TDP also uses a third-party software and I have seen instabilities when using this on this laptop, so hopefully that will be changed with a software update. So my main goal is to look at disabling the CPU boost and reviewing the effects from that but I will go in and show how you can enable and use each of these options. Before this, let's have a first look at the results. Simply disabling boost increased performance in the CPU intensive game Cyberpunk by 10% while at the same time having much better fan speeds, 
15 degrees lower CPU temp and drawing 13 watts or 18% less power than before. Disabling boost really do work wonders in GPU bottleneck games and <laughs> that's most games in a thinner light laptop. So by going into power plan setting, pressing change advanced settings and expanding processor power management you will see all the windows power options relating to the processor. All options are not visible as standard and I will show you how to get them visible. Maximum power frequency for this laptop has a default setting of max boost up to 4000 MHz while on battery power, while a zero signifies that there is no cap when plugged in. There is also another option available that you can enable for power efficiency class 1 processor, but this did not have any effect on my laptop so I believe it can be disregarded at least in this case. So for instance if you would like a maximum boost up to 3900 MHz, simply set that amount and save and the laptop will max out at the given limit. For the Pro X the restriction worked as long as you did not start any games as the laptop then disregarded the limit and used a modified power plan. Minimum and maximum processor states are standard features and determines how relaxed the processor can get while not being used. By default the battery option is lower while the plugged in option remains at 80% to avoid any potential delays in performance. Setting a max Maximum processor state simply caps out the CPU frequency, where 100% signifies the base frequency, so setting it at 90% for example would cap the processor around 2880 MHz in this case. Lastly we have the processor performance boost mode which is set to aggressive as standard. This means that the CPU will always target the boost as high as possible beyond its base frequency. There are a lot of options for this setting and we will shortly look at why that doesn't really matter. And now how to add the settings. To add the maximum frequency and CPU boost settings in the power plan, you simply enter the registry editor as admin, you locate two folders and then you change attributes from the value 1 to the value 2. I will show the steps here and will of course also add the instructions in the video description. You don't actually need to click through all the folders because you can search for the path directly, but here I show each step. And you're done! It's now visible in the power settings. I strongly recommend switching between disabled and aggressive CPU boost state depending on your workload. So for that reason I have created a guide on how to create desktop shortcuts which lets you change the power setting with the click of a button. The command lines shown here are simply pasted into a empty shortcut and then you're good to go. I also recommend adding icons to them for clarity and some extra desktop flair. When they are correctly set up, pressing disable or enable will consequently change the plug in boost date. If you would like, you could also have the same settings for battery by switching the file path from AC to DC. But I recommend always keeping battery boost disabled as that can even impact the setting when plugged in. The AMD APU tuning utility enables us to change a lot of settings regarding both the CPU and also the APU. The software is undergoing development to accommodate both Intel and AMD CPUs, so expect the software to improve over time. There are presets that can be used, but here I focus on manual control. The main aspects we look at are temp limits and TDP limits. Temp limits enables us to set custom limits, which means that the CPU will adjust and throttle down to keep within the set temperature limits. This is another way of reducing power and heat, but as most laptops share heatsink between the CPU and the GPU, it is difficult to get predictable performance from the CPU if the GPU actually heats the heatsink up. The TDP limits can be modified to enable short boosts of extended power, or you can simply set a fixed cap for all states. As we aim to go with low power, I have opted for changing all the states to the same value. In the curve optimizer, you are able to set a negative value and be able to undervolt your CPU. This does not seem to work on the 6800HS, but I have read reports of it working on the 6900HS. I would be very interested in hearing your thoughts and if you have tested this. 
Auto reapply is an important setting to ensure that your settings remain active. The Pro X for example have flexible power states and will override these settings unless they are reapplied. Every 3 seconds is a good middle ground and the application itself is not very resource intensive so the application effect is minimal. Do keep in mind that if you want to cancel and revert these changes it's not possible to, to simply do it in the app but rather you need to restart the computer. So that was the three main options in how to limit CPU power and heat and now we will deep dive into the effects of disabling processor boost for the Lenovo Pro X. As shown earlier there is a multitude of options in terms of boost modes and almost every option is as ambiguous as the next. I mean what does this phrase mean and why isn't it always enabled? It feels like there were some very clever developers working on this and they simply got bored and stopped working on it after they named the schedules. But regardless of description, let's look at the actual results. Here we can see the performance of each boost mode in terms of Cyberpunk benchmarks and Cinebench R23. And thank you Oakenglass for the Cinebench numbers. The link to his video is added into the description. Both his and my assessment is the same and that is that there are no material differences between every mode apart from CPU boost disabled. If running games at more than 100 FPS there might be some additional differences but all options apart from disabled is essentially the same in Cyberpunk and in Cinebench. This enables me to reach the conclusion that it's perfect enough just to switch between the default which is aggressive and then the disabled setting. Looking at the effects of CPU clock, running in aggressive mode during a cyberpunk benchmark means that the CPU tops out at an average all core clock of around 4.2 GHz, while the disabled boost is capped at a constant 3.2 GHz. The average core clock is reduced by 14% while power draw is cut in half so huge gains in terms of power to performance. The reduced power draw leads to a 15 degree drop in CPU temp, which can be improved even further through undervolting the GPU. This temperature drop happens despite of the fans running much more silently. Returning to Cyberpunk 2077, which is a very demanding title both for the CPU and GPU, we can see that disabling the CPU boost frees up more power to be used by the GPU, which provides a 10% average FPS increase for both the 0.1, 1% lows and average FPS. This happens despite of 10 watts less being consumed, which does wonders in terms of reducing the heat and the fan noise. Cyberpunk does have some weird behaviors in terms of stutters, but I did not see an issue with disabling boost compared to running with the CPU fully enabled. But for all games I recommend testing and ensuring that the games run smoothly when using the CPU boost feature. Otherwise, just disable it with the shortcuts I showed earlier. Enabling the GPU to draw more power also enables us to fine-tune the GPU voltage and frequency curve in Afterburner. This allows the GPU to increase the core clock at lower voltages and I will create a dedicated video for this shortly after this one. I have created two undervolt settings where one clocks higher than the base setting while consuming less power. This is used during demanding gaming tasks as well as when editing videos in DaVinci. For less demanding titles I have created a curve or a flat line rather that maxes out at the lowest possible voltage of 0 0.0 volt. And as you can see, this still enables us to nearly match the default settings while consuming 46 watts instead of 72 watts. That's a reduction of 34% in power and 7 decibels lower noise, and it's a treat to game with. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we see similar positive results for disabling the boost and also for the high performing undervolt and overclock. But the low powered GPU undervolt setting does fall behind a bit in this game. In Civilization 6, we see even greater results with a performance boost of 16 to 20%, which means that it's very safe to increase the graphic settings in this title without any performance issues. In the CPU test for Civilization, we see slightly longer turn times when disabling the boost, 7 seconds with default and 7.7 .7 seconds with boost disabled. Those are the games that I've tested and I reiterate that CPU boost is best used when FPS is below 100 and for competitive games such as Counter-Strike and Fortnite with low graphical settings, 
we can see CPU bottlenecks and therefore it might perform better with CPU boost set at aggressive. Then what about productive tasks? Should we always let CPU boost be disabled? Well, running PCMOG 10, we see a reduction compared against intelligent cooling of around 20%, both in score and also when looking at loading and compute times when opening apps, web surfing and doing Excel tasks. Buying a premium CPU and then capping it to only boost to 68% of its potential does have consequences, and I would recommend having the CPU boost enabled when working in ordinary tasks just to fully enjoy the powerhouse of a CPU in here. But, as you see here, it's perfectly doable to have it disabled at all time if you prefer a cooler and more quiet laptop. To sum it all up, simply disabling the boost setting will in most cases improve your gaming performance, reduce power consumption, heat and fan noise. The noise reduction of 5 decibels alone is definitely worth it and uh, uh, this first step is so very simple so I recommend everyone to test it out. Do keep in mind that this is not a magical solution, as we are reducing the performance of the CPU. But in many cases the CPU is just a power glutton and boosts without actually adding to performance. In the cases when the CPU boost is needed however, such as working with video editing or playing competitive games at over 100 FPS, it's advisable to let the CPU boost to max. I also hope that the AMD tuning utility will be more stable for this laptop to further test a limited TDP and to have the option to let the CPU perform more as a 6800U. I will update you on this further as more releases are available. I haven't seen anyone doing a guide for adding quick desktop shortcuts for changing the boost setting, so hopefully this in-depth review and quick adjustment possibilities has been of interest. For more game comparisons, there are other YouTube videos that explore more games with the CPU boost disabled. My recommendation, add the shortcut button and start disabling CPU boost when gaming. If you notice uneven or poor performance, simply enable CPU boost again. But with this simple setting, you will in almost every case find yourself experiencing better performance and a cooler laptop. A special thanks to everyone who made it through the entire video, and please like and especially subscribe to the video. Your feedback and just seeing you subscribe uh, is really what drives me to continue creating content, so thank you and I hope to see you in the next video where I deep dive into undervolting the RTX 3050. Take care and bye for now.